Hello and welcome to our webinar. My name's uh, Ben Troke. I'm a partner at uh, Hill Dickinson uh, Solicitors and uh, I'll introduce uh, my colleague uh, Amy Clark who's uh, speaking in uh, a few minutes and uh, our guest speaker uh, Rachel Griffiths uh, in just a moment. Um, before we do and while people are still joining us um, let me uh, run through some bits of the housekeeping. Um, if I can, if you could just move on a slide, please, Amy. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, numbers uh, attending today are um, terrific. We're really pleased to see uh, so many people joining uh, these sessions, uh, but they do mean that uh, we need to disable uh, cameras. We need to disable the uh, microphones. Um, so I'm sorry for that. Um, as interactive as we can make it um, is to invite you to um, let us know what you think and to ask us questions using the chat box. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on that while um, our speakers are speaking um, and then we'll try and uh, tackle as many of the questions as we possibly can uh, before the end of the uh, session. Um, and please do also get in touch uh, directly anyway, and I'll say a bit more about that um, in a minute. Uh, the session is being recorded, and again, the recording of the session will be sent out as part of the follow-up. Um, and with that, um, we'll also try and include uh, a Q&A uh, document. Um, my, my heart sinks in offering this because it's <laughs> going to be uh, a job and a half, I think. But um, uh, we will try and tackle, uh, we'll group together and pick out themes of, uh, of any of the questions that come in uh, through the chat function um, throughout this hour. Um, and we'll we'll work up a document over the next few days and send it out as part of the uh, follow up, uh, which I hope will be helpful. Um, in terms of the uh, tech support, um, we do sometimes find that people struggle with some IT issues joining, particularly from NHS um, addresses or, uh, or IT. Um, I'm afraid all we can say is uh, please uh, log off uh, and, uh, and rejoin. Uh, which uh, is the advice we get from our uh, our own tech support. Um, and um, if you do really struggle to join the live session, uh, as I say, there'll be a recording sent um, afterwards, um, as well as the slides and the Q and A uh, document, which will be our pleasure, Pip. I'm glad it's uh, I'm glad it's going to be helpful. Um, there will be uh, a chance to let us know what you think um, with a survey uh, afterwards, and we're really grateful for the feedback you can give us uh, through that because it helps us make sure that these sessions um, are covering what you want to hear uh, and not just what we think uh, we ought to tell you. Um, so let us know what you think of the session and what else you would like us to do. Um, for now, we've been running LPS um, preparation implementation webinars uh, every three months. Uh, for the last year or so and every one of the sessions I've been saying code of practice will be out any day now uh, and now uh, now we actually have it so uh, I'm pretty sure we'll be continuing the webinars every three months or so through to uh, implementation uh, but again let us know what you think of that if they're useful uh, and what you would like us uh, to cover and then the last line there on that first slide is uh, is about the follow-up um, in the next hour and we have deliberately just kept this session to an hour um, we will um, have two speakers. Um, I've just got one slide of, of preamble to set the scene um, and then we'll push on to our two speakers. Um, Amy is going to uh, help us uh, with a summary um, as best you can of uh, 530 odd pages um, of uh, what we know about the LPS. Uh, now that we do have the draft code of practice. Um, and then to bring uh, a nice positive uh, perspective, our glass half full, uh, rather than pick holes in it, uh, which a consultation tends to uh, tends to invite. Um, I'm delighted that Rachel Griffiths is, uh, is joining us to talk about what we can usefully do now. How do we get on with this? Um, whatever we think of uh, what's out for consultation right now. Um, we've put Q&A in for the last 15 minutes. I very much hope we'll be getting to the Q&A a little bit sooner um, and we can spend as much as possible of the hour um, tackling the, the questions that you'd like to ask us through the, the chat box. I hope that's OK. Um, and uh, if uh, if so, we'll crack on. Let me just do my my one slide. Uh, of, uh, of preamble. Thanks, Amy. Um, 
the Liberty Protection Safeguards. Um, as I uh, as I said, um, for ooh, years now, I've been saying I'll probably be retired before this actually goes live. Uh, but now we do actually have the code of practice out for consultation from 17th of March um, 2022. Um, I don't know if the government thought we couldn't possibly leave it another two days to the eighth anniversary uh, of the Cheshire West uh, judgment uh, and just had to get on with it. Um, it does have the whiff of a document that um, has been prepared in a bit of a hurry. Um, it's full of typos, it's full of mistaken cross references that I don't think do it justice because it gives an impression of uh, a, a document that hasn't quite been polished as it might have been. Um, but we will try and talk about the, the substance of it and there's there's plenty of that. Um, the consultation period is open for longer than usual. It's normally 12 weeks for a consultation. This one's 16 weeks, uh, but I don't want to alarm you. We are already six weeks uh, into that uh, period. So uh, if you're still, still stuck on chapter 12, the definition of a deprivation of liberty, like I was for the first three or four weeks, um, there is uh, uh, there's plenty still to do. Um, Three or four headlines uh, from it, just to set the scene before I hand over to Amy. Um, the first thing is, is it actually happening? Um, it's been kicked down the road for so long um, from the Law Commission's uh, review to the legislation, to the delay, delay, delay um, of the Code of Practice being published. Um, it is now here and any sense that the LPS might be put on the back burner, perhaps as part of a more fundamental review of the Human Rights Act. Uh, and everything that uh, comes under that umbrella. Um, that's all put to one side. We've got to, uh, got to expect this to, to be happening now. It's rooted in the Mental Capacity Act. I think that's a great thing. Um, uh, whenever I'm asked to give training about liberty, protection, safeguards or doles uh, at the moment, um, I will only do it on the basis I spend the first half of the time talking about the MCA, uh, because I will always say if, you get, if you're getting the Mental Capacity Act right, uh, then so much of the, the doll and dolls issues falls into place. Um, I am pleased to see that there's uh, now a single code. So it's an updated code of practice for the Mental Capacity Act. It's a new code of practice for the LPS all rolled into a single document and the old dolls code of practice all uh, um, disappear. That's good thing um, for, for the reason I've given. Um, LPS like dolls must be rooted in the MCA and in getting the MCA right. But it does mean that the first 250 pages of the document are all about the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, and then the second half goes on to uh, talk about um, the LPS. Um, for today's purposes, the focus is on the LPS. Um, we've already put out a first thoughts note about the LPS um, consultation key points. Uh, we're just finalising a document on the MCA uh, bits, those first 10, uh, 11 chapters uh, of the Code of Practice, and that will be out in the next few days. Um, the time scale, um, it's not explicit on the face of the consultation, but working it through um, with the consultation open until the 7th of July, um, the government, I understand, expects to be chewing over the responses and producing its final version of the code um, into next year. Um, plus then 40 days in front of Parliament for the final version of the code and the regs, and then at least six months for implementation. I think October 2023 to go live is ambitious. I think it's much more likely we're looking at April 2024, so still two years away uh, before the LPS um, goes live, I think. Um, we do want to hear from you. We'll put on some contact details on a slide uh, a little bit later on. More importantly, perhaps, um, the... Um, uh, Department of Health and Social Care wants to hear from you. Please do respond to, to the consultation. It's so important that you do um, for some of the reasons that we'll get onto where it's controversial. Um, if you need any help in um, getting your views in for the consultation, uh, let us know. Um, now I'm going to dive into the, the chat uh, where there's some, also some uh, already some useful stuff going to and fro uh, and I will leave you to Amy to give you some headlines on um, the, the LPS bit of the code of practice as it is. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Ben. Um, so yes, as Ben has said, over the next 20 minutes or so, my plan is to summarise where we are now uh, with the LPS. So what do we have from the government in draft form? 
what questions did we have um, and have they been answered or addressed by the code and what questions we may still have um, or perhaps some clarification we may be waiting on um, as well. So as you can appreciate, it's not intended to be a sort of chapter and verse on all of the published materials as that would certainly not take 20 minutes. But the aim of the session really is to highlight the main points in relation to the draft code and hand the baton um, to you as well. So you have an opportunity to put forward your feedback and, and your questions. So without further ado, what have we actually got? Um, so on the 17th of March, the long awaited um, LPS documentation, as Ben has said, was published by the Department of Health and Social Care. And if like me, you've printed it off and um, even double sided, it amounts to a huge lever arch file of documents. So there is um, a, a lot, but here I have summarised what we do have, which is the updated draft combined code, which Ben has just mentioned, six draft regulations, which essentially govern the new system. Um, so ranging from the eligibility framework for those professionals conducting the new assessments to other amendments to the Mental Capacity Act, for example, to encompass the new role of the IMCA as well as other things. Um, the remaining five documents are essentially there to help stakeholders prepare for the implementation of the LPS, um, although they're not part of the sort of formal consultation document. And they are the um, impact um, assessment, which is essentially the government's financial calculation of the impact of, of LPS. The um, workforce and, um, and training strategy, um, again, covering sort of workforce planning, the learning, development and training that's on offer and what different organisations can do to sort of begin preparing for the implementation of the LPS. You have the training framework, which is about recommending certain subject areas that the LPS training should cover. And then you have a um, national minimum data set, which is about standardising collection and data, um, submission of data to the monitoring um, bodies and NHS Digital. And finally, um, but importantly, the Equalities Impact Assessment, which assesses the uh, potential equality impact of the design of the LPS overall. So that is what we have. Um, as I say, the focus on my session today is on the draft updated code of practice, and I've essentially split it into two parts. So the first part is the sort of MCA part of the code, if you like, and the second part is the LPS part. And as we know, the government, um, and as Ben has already mentioned, has decided to introduce one overarching code to ensure the principles of the MCA are firmly embedded within the LPS system. So the first 11 chapters of the code will look broadly familiar to you in terms of the chapter headings um, as they are familiar with the um, to the original 2007 code. And there are also chapters at the end, 21 to sort of 26, which pick up on MCA themes from the original code. So how it applies to children and young people, how to resolve disputes and disagreements and the relationship between the MHA and the MCA. They're in those sort of later chapters towards the end. But the focus on the MCA updates um, is on the chapters 1 to 11. And I've, I've split them um, into sort of three key themes in terms of what does this new code um, intend to do and intend to, to tackle, I suppose. And the first one is the, the sort of the legal angle or the legal updates. So as you will know, there's been a great deal of activity um, and case law arising from the MCA since it came into force and the code is now actually over 13 years old. So the draft updated code in respect of the MCA part refers to um, a, a number of cases throughout and you will have seen that they're in the footnotes and the footnotes are actually linked directly to the judgments on Bailey, which is a really good resource, I, I think, um, in terms of um, directing um, practitioners to the underlying case law. So um, just a couple of examples. The um, the principle of identifying available options before a best interest process is commenced. The N and ACCG case from 2017 is referred to and um, the holistic approach to best interests as per the decision in Aintree hospitals um, in 2013 is referred to uh, and many others um, of which I'm not going to go into detail on now. And, and of course, the code itself has to be relatively selective about how many in which cases it refers to. It, it wouldn't be able to cover all of the relevant cases since 2007, but 
you can see where it has addressed and brought it up to date from those um, case law um, those cases that have, have arisen since then. Secondly, um, the practical angle. So practitioners have now been applying the principles of the MCA for a number of years and the draft code aims to reflect good practice and also um, reflect how organisational structures operate. So NHS trusts, CCGs and local authorities. A couple of highlights in particular. So there is a recognition within the draft updated code that there's often an MDT approach to best interest decision making. So the decision maker may in fact be a different person to the person implementing the care plan or the treatment. And there's sort of a recognition of that working practice and how to essentially deal with that and record that best interest decision making. There's guidance on who should apply to court. And that's a, a query we get quite often in cases involving um, you know, local authorities and CCGs as well as NHS trusts. And um, so whilst it doesn't go into a great detail into great detail on um, you know, those cases where there might be jointly funded or jointly commissioned packages, there is some guidance there on who should be applying to court in those more sort of, sort of straightforward cases. So it, that's the practical element that, that that's bringing it up to up to speed with what practitioners have been doing and what should what they should be doing on a sort of day to day basis to implement the um, the, the Act's principles. And finally, it, it does try and it does try and tackle those inherently challenging concepts that have occurred um, whilst applying the Act through the years. And for example, um, fluctuating capacity. So it looks at that um, isolated versus repeated decision making concept. Um, it also looks at executive functioning. So where there's a mismatch between what a person says um, in relation to a decision, but actually what they do when they there being some requirement within the code for evidence of a repeated mismatch to, to make a decision that someone perhaps lacks capacity. And perhaps most importantly, um, there is the um, the change within the code of the order of the test of um, capacity. So that is to avoid automatic assumptions essentially being made that a person can't make a decision because of their condition. So um, that's a, a, a a, a big departure from how the, the previous code was was drafted. Now I'm leaving the MCA part of the code there because this is an LPS session and I want to look at what questions have been answered um, by the um, new draft code of practice in relation to LPS. So what has been answered, what has been addressed and the first and perhaps the most controversial or certainly the one that will be subject to the most scrutiny by you all, I'm sure in a lot of respect is the definition of a deprivation of liberty. So what this chapter does, which is chapter 12, is it contains the government's promised um, non-statutory definition of a deprivation of liberty alongside a number of case scenarios. And it's suggested uh, in both the text and in the case studies that someone essentially is left to their own devices uh, for substantial parts of their time is not likely to be under continuous supervision and control, which is that element of the Cheshire West definition that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Though when you then compare that to um, some of the sort of case law that we have already, there does appear to be in, in some respects a, a, a mismatch there. Um, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions in relation to the um, the, the definition uh, chapter and the case scenarios in particular. Um, elsewhere in the code, it refers to the reasons for the placement, for example, the purpose of the restrictions or how happy a, a sort of patient or service user is in the arrangements, which um, has a resonance with the Court of Appeal decision in Cheshire West, but that Court of Appeal decision was overturned by the Supreme Court. And so there's um, understandably some concern that there's um, it, it's taking that that approach in Cheshire West sort of uh, or it's it's going away from that approach in the Supreme Court in Cheshire West to, to some extent. What it does say in the code is it's very important to bear in mind that supervision and control should not be inappropriately downplayed as support. Um, although some of the case studies that we or case scenarios within the code um, do look um, in some respects like cases which we have seen courts in in other cases find that there is a deprivation of liberty. So there'll be a lot in terms of the consultation on this part of the um, of the uh, consultation. So moving on to who will be qualified to carry out 
the three assessments. So this is now clear um, from the code and the regulations. The mental capacity assessment and the necessary and proportionate assessments can be done by essentially an identical list of practitioners. So that's a medical practitioner, a nurse, an OT, a social worker, a psychologist or a speech and language therapist. Um, obviously, the medical assessments may only be carried out by a medical practitioner and that includes GPs and psychiatrists or a registered psychologist who meets the conditions of those regulations. What we will envisage seeing is a um, with the medical assessment in particular is probably a bottleneck um, as we do already experience that in relation to getting those medical assessments in support of doll applications in the community. Um, so that's a sort of practical um, question we probably have in terms of its application. Although I think the impact assessment states that in 85% um, of cases there should or will already be an equivalent assessment of a mental disorder that can be relied upon. So in theory that that in the majority of cases will already be there. Who carries out that pre-authorisation review? So in the non-AMCP cases, that individual um, does not need to be a health or social care professional. However, they should have an applied understanding of the Mental Capacity Act and the LPS process. And additionally, um, they basically mustn't be involved in the day to day care of the person or be involved in providing any treatment to the person either. So paragraphs 13, um, 49 to 13, 5, 3 set out the criteria of when a pre-authorisation review must be undertaken by an AMCP and there's more detail in there if you um, if you want to turn to that. Moving on to who will be the authoriser at the responsible body, well that again has been left open in the code so it's not specified in the code or the regs, um, it will essentially be up to each responsible body. Perhaps surprisingly, the code says that it's possible for the same person to carry out the PAR and grant the authorisation, provided they can show a degree of separation between the roles so that they are acting independently when carrying out the pre-authorisation review and then when they switch hats um, as the responsible body when authorising it. So it will be interesting to know and to hear from you how that might work and what we can do in terms of um, helping sort of prepare for that and creating that sufficient degree of separation between roles if indeed the pre-authorisation reviewer is the same as the, the authoriser. But in theory that, that is permitted under the code. Training, um, now what level of training is required? So as I explained at the, at the beginning about what documents we've had uh, published, there is a workforce and training strategy and a training framework um, and questions 23 and 24 of the consultation ask for feedback on this. And I won't go into a great deal, deal of detail because that framework and that documentation itself is incredibly detailed and, and important, but it does um, essentially separate the different roles um, within a sort of triangle in terms of um, the level A being all health and social care staff up to the top level at level F, and it has an accumulating learning content prescribed essentially for each role. And that is a very useful resource for looking at sort of what resources may be required within your organisations um, in terms of um, preparing for the LPS being implemented. And the workforce strategy document also sort of sets out um, how you might calculate um, how that resource might be um, sort of arrived at. And there are various suggestions, some from um, that have been implemented by other um, councils across the country to calculate who essentially, wh wh what people may be in scope for the LPS and then matching your existing workforce to what would be the future workforce once the LPS comes in. So there is lots in there um, in relation to sort of what resources may be required. In terms of how we will define objection, now this is crucial because aside from the independent hospital element, the access to an AMCP for the pre-authorisation review effectively hinges on whether the person is objecting. And so it's defined as if it is reasonable to believe that the person does not wish to reside in the place that is proposed, or it is reasonable to believe the person does not wish to receive the care or treatment in the place proposed. And there is some guidance in paragraphs 18 um, to, about the level of evidence that's needed to recognise an objection. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave you to sort of look at that. But what 
um, I found interesting is it emphasises that regard should be had not just to statements made by the person, but other expressions of emotional state, verbal and nonverbal behaviour, their demeanour and um, other actions and whether they're being prescribed medication, perhaps their mood or depression. So it's really looking at the wider context in terms of defining whether someone is perhaps objecting um, to their arrangements or not. And finally, the um, how portable is it? Well, uh, it can be is the answer if the arrangements are foreseen. So the draft code explains that as a general rule where changes of setting can be reasonably foreseen. So regular respite being an example or a planned move um, or a planned hospital stay, these can be included in the authorization record. Um, however, there will of course be arrangements which aren't foreseen and the portability doesn't quite apply um, in those circumstances and a new authorization would be required um, in, a, in a new setting um, if that was not a sort of foreseen arrangement. So there are some of the key questions which we feel have been you know, addressed, even though of course there might be some controversy sort of around them. These are some of the issues we feel have been um, answered perhaps partially or perhaps um, still require clarification through the consultation process and some quite deliberately are probably not as prescriptive because they will um, evolve as 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 the mm -hmm. principles are applied in in practice and and we get new case law in relation to them but let's just have a quick look at them so one of them is this life-saving medical treatment um, question and it's one of those questions which I think has been answered but questions will likely still remain and that is where is that line between the situation of a deprivation of liberty authorised by that new emergency provision under section 4b and where it's not a doll at all following the Ferreira Court of Appeal judgment and what is now enshrined within the code um, although expanded on. So chapter 12 puts that Ferreira principle in the code in terms sort of broadly, argu sorry, arguably broader than the um, Ferreira case. Um, and it states that a deprivation of liberty will not occur if the person is treated for a physical illness and the treatment is given under arrangements that are the same as would have been for a, um, in a place for a person who did not have a mental disorder. And in Interestingly and importantly, that extends to any setting where medical treatment is provided, so not just in hospitals. Um, there are case studies around this principle as well, which we could discuss at length, and I'm not going to hear, but Ms. Ms. K is, is one of them, and I'm sure you've all, all read about that one. Moving on to the emergency provision, that's dealt with in Chapter 19, and that deals with this Section 4B power. And what that does is set out four conditions which must be met to lawfully deprive someone of their liberty for life sustaining medical treatment or a vital act in an emergency. And um, it envisages that unless in rare cases where the emergency is totally over and there's no need to trigger the LPS process, that power is essentially to be used obviously in an emergency, but as a bridge to then getting some authorization for that continued confinement, either through the LPS or from the court. I've just noted on, on the slide there, what about palliative care? Because obviously that wouldn't fall within the um, Section 4B um, criteria. And I've, I've mentioned advanced consent and the code does allow for advanced consent to arrangements which would amount to a doll. And it specifically refers at paragraph 1255 to end of life care. So that may, may be an arrangement that can be pre-authorised um, by the person couple of practical points and um, appreciate time is, is moving on, but that these are just um, some practical questions around the transition essentially and what happens with unprocessed um, applications, either dolls or, or um, uh, court applications. So in relation to the um, uh, the the court of protection um, uh, applications that, that it, it is relatively sort of silent on what will happen with regard to those um, and how they will be um, picked up but there are transition provisions in relation to the dolls backlog um, and and the, the dates by which the new um, LPS um, will be implemented and there's quite a lot around that which we can speak about in the Q&A if that's particularly of, of interest to you at this stage. 
What I did want to just mention as well is the care home special rules. So when introduced to Parliament, as you know, the scheme included special treatment for arrangements in care homes, um, where if they wish, the responsible body could ask the care home manager to do a lot of the sort of legwork and the heavy lifting and arranging the assessments um, and such. That was dropped throughout the process, but there is a question in the consultation at 12 about canvassing opinion on whether that scheme should be reinstated. And so it's not so totally off the table at, at the moment. And finally, what about the question that's central to all of this, which is what is necessary and proportionate and what is meant by this? Now, this is addressed and it is addressed at paragraph 16.59 of the draft code. And what is clear is it's not a replacement for the best interests assessment. The idea is that will have already taken place and there is a lawful best interest decision already made at which person it may well be the same person conducts um, the necessary and proportionate assessment after a lawful um, best interest decision has been made. Um, and there is um, guidance within the code on it. Um, perhaps it would have been one that um, could have been critically analysed a bit more through case studies and perhaps it might be um, through the sort of evolution um, in the consultation process. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of food for thought in, in that test that I'm sure you've all got your sort of views and, and thoughts on. So that covers what um, the essentially the kind of questions or the key questions we feel have been answered and perhaps those which are, are left to, to be answered. Moving on now to the, the, what we can all do about the draft code and the regs and what opportunities you have to sort of provide feedback through the consultation process. So we know that the consultation will close on the 7th of July and time is obviously ticking on and the government expects to take until at least the winter of 2022-2023 to consider these um, responses. If you've read, seen the consultation document, it's it's pretty detailed, um, 60 pages, there's 25 questions split into those five sections which appear on the slide and the code um, element um, of the consultation is then grouped into three sections again to try and help people pinpoint the area which most relates to your role. Um, generally narrowly worded um, limited to word counts where there are um, you know, opportunities to expand. Um, two particularly interesting questions are 20 and 21 and that really are they are the broad questions about whether you feel there's anything missing from the code or whether you feel there's anything missing in the case studies and there's some specific pointers to areas which they feel they would like your um, input on so emergency services and um, use of social media being one of them so any suggestions around the existing case scenarios or new ones as well is very much welcome through the consultation um, process so that um, wraps up my very much sort of whistle stop tour of where we are now with the LPS. I am going to just hand over to Ben briefly before we um, turn to Rachel, who will just um, hand the baton to you, so to speak, in relation to consultation. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Amy. Um, I won't um, delay with this slide um, other than say it's ever so important that everyone who can, everyone who wants to responds to the consultation. Um, we want to hear from you too, and if we can help you with the, the consultation response, do drop us a line on those contact details. Um, Rachel, I'll hand over to you. Um, if I can ask you perhaps to, to try and keep to about 10 minutes or so, so we do have the Q&A time at the end, I'd be really, really grateful. I'm sorry, it's entirely our fault we've uh, left you uh, a little bit less time than, than we hoped. Uh, but uh, Rachel Griffiths, um, to introduce uh, her, has been involved with uh, DOLS since its implementation. Uh, and has had uh, various roles uh, in it over the years, uh, including being the CQC's lead on the uh, Mental Capacity Act. So I'm, I'm delighted she's uh, here to um, give us these uh, these few thoughts today. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Ben. I will try my level best to keep to time because I think your questions and perceptions are the most important thing about being here, really. We've I didn't know till Ben uh, introduced the start of this session that my job was to be the Pollyanna and tell you how wonderful it was all going to be. Um, I find that somewhat difficult, but I am looking a little bit more about um, some slightly sideways looks into the process. I think as Amy's made it very clear, we can all lose ourselves in the 
intricacies of the code and the other documents. Um, and at this stage, it's worth doing because we might be able to improve matters, but um, it isn't um, entirely fixed yet, um, any of this. Um, next slide, please. So I thought I would start by looking at the impact assessment um, to see, partly because it's shorter, <laughs> but also to see what the actual policy objectives were. I think any of you that have looked in the code, uh, when you see that the first one is simplification, um, you do begin to wonder um, in some parts of the code. But I do like it that it's going to be embedded in care planning. And of course, it needs to widen out to protect the rights of people um, who, whose rights, sure, can be protected now by an application to the court. But saving your presence, lawyers, many of us find that so daunting um, and terribly expensive of, of our time and emotional well-being that um, I think a process does have advantages. Um, flexible, where well, you've heard that it's no longer quite as movable and encompassing different settings as it might have once been, but I think it's on the way. Um, the policy objective of better, quicker outcomes for people, I think it's important that we don't um, combine better with necessarily quicker and vice versa. Um, but on the other hand, long delays that we've had for the past few years since Cheshire West bit home um, have not been good for anybody. And it is true that that um, is a move towards improved access to human rights. Um, legally compliant, uh, with the Human Rights Act and even moving towards CRPD. Um, in 10 minutes, I'm not going to get into the, are we moving towards CRPD? And if so, in what ways and whither and whence, et cetera. But it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, it's a specific policy objective that the time scales um, will not be missed. Well. The real reason why they're not going to be is that I appreciate there are some in the code and there's the talk of 21 days, but the only actual written down in the law deadline that um, responsible bodies are going to have to comply with is the 72 hours to give um, full information about an authorization to the person and other people who are, um, have been involved in the consultations. I think that is obviously a very important thing. I would say that I think it's got stranded in there as a deadline from when it was going through the House of Lords, when I think one particular um, peer was particularly keen on this. So it's not that it's the most important of all possible deadlines or all the things that we've had with with dolls but you know, it's one of them and they wish of course for it to be cheaper than dolls plus the court of protection route which it certainly is the numbers in the code of practice i think can be treated with a certain amount of caution because a lot of them are pretend well they're not pretending of course they're not i wouldn't say that they are comparing the costs of a notional dolls fully resourced with LPS. So it's not really a great surprise to me that it comes out as double, um, double and a bit more actually, if we were to have dolls properly implemented and, and properly resourced. Um, but I mean, that ship sailed, didn't it? When the bill became an act and we all know that and that isn't going to happen. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think some of the assumptions in the impact assessment are worth at least us being aware of. Um, they do seem to be assuming that an authorised deprivation of liberty is always a good thing. Um, 
there are the arguments that say that the state's intervention in private lives has to be treated with a real kind of, of caution. Um, they actually spell out among non-monetized, if that's how you pronounce it, benefits, um, that people who lack capacity will gain greater empowerment uh, as well as equality and improved care outcomes. Now, these are things that I want to see. They're things we all desperately want to see. I'm not sure if the stru structural issues that have led to care outcomes not always being such that we're very happy with them, whether we're judges in the Court of Protection or BIAs or in the future AMCP. There is this problem that you can only really judge between available options and if what's available is not very good. I think we have to be careful about what we're asking LPS to produce and what we have to do um, in, other, in other ways um, and think about other responsibilities. Um, the NHS and the integrated care boards, again, it's lovely that there are roles for them. Um, I'm not sure how much of those roles will actually be delegated across or um, Section 75 agreemented across to local authorities. I mean, I think that's for local determination, but I think in some places it might happen. And of course, the combination of Ferreira and Section 4B means that I think there are some doubts, at least in my mind, about how much um, LPS will be used in health settings, um, but we shall see. And something that bothers me about the financial bits of the LPS is that having said quite rightly how great it is to extend this out to other settings, um, the community social care that is so um, important in supported living, etc., cetera, um, barely gets a mention throughout the impact assessment. So I think that is um, a little bit of a worry to me. Um, and I will just say on this slide as well, um, challenge. We've all said, and personally, I have taken my leave very often or been reminded of where my mind ought to be by Lucy Series, who um, looked at earlier drafts of this impact assessment, where they hoped to reduce the rates of challenge from 1% of all dolls um, authorizations, and 1% is pretty low, but they wished to halve it to 0.5%. Now, they've now taken that back up. I think probably Lucy ought to get some of the credit for this, um, up to 1%. Um, but again, I think what they've done with the appropriate adult, who's the what was under dolls, the RPR, but um, uh, um, can't be a paid person. It worries me that they're suggesting in the code that somebody who um, can see the purpose and see the relevance and possibly even see the importance of um, and the rightness of depriving somebody of their liberty possibly should be regarded with huge suspicion. Now, I know the case that this goes back to, um, and certainly you can't have um, a supporter whose job is to help you challenge um, who um, is determined that they never will. I mean, you must have somebody who can. But the combination of, um, you might think that, for example, as an as an appropriate adult, that what is being proposed is actually very good. When you see it, you might not, because it might not work or it might not be to that person's um, judgment. But the idea that the responsible body before kickoff decides um, about the attitudes of the person in great detail, I think maybe that's just something they could phrase a little bit better, as is the one that says that if a spouse 
finds it difficult to understand responsible body processes, um, they should. And again, I think uh, responsible body processes are pretty difficult for us all, perhaps. But still, um, next slide, please. So I do think that we need to consider the underlying importance of the philosophical principles and the misuse of power to states um, and the recognition of how Im important somebody's individual happiness and autonomy are. I know that, that you know all this, but I think we can get caught up on systems. Next slide, please. What can we do to get ready? Collect assessments. It will make you immensely popular with everybody. Go back to the wider Mental Capacity Act, which is at the heart of this. Um, put necessity and proportionality at the heart of any interventions and record that. It's a good way of achieving good practice. And I think we all need to go on looking for this intuitive simplicity that was our objective. Um, next slide, please. I know I'm asking you to balance um, a lot of uh, balancing the autonomy and protection within the Mental Capacity Act and not be too scared of the sharks of bureaucracy. And at that point, I will hand back to Ben. Marvellous. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I've been doing my best to pick up some of the questions as they've come uh, into the chat box, but there's some either I haven't got to or I've picked out as um, I think being worth more than the, than the couple of lines I can I can put in the chat box. Um, but let me deal with a couple fairly quickly. Um, there's a question in there about the role of CCGs as the responsible body as it's currently drafted. Of course, uh, you know, the world has changed while LPS has been trickling through uh, Parliament and uh, the, the Department of Health and Social Care. And uh, by the time it comes into four CCGs are going to be no more. It's going to be uh, ICSs uh, run by ICBs. Um, so uh, I think that that's right, Andrew, to the extent that uh, the, the code of practice at the moment refers to CCGs that that needs to be read as the ICS. Um, and it's a little bit surprised having published it in the middle of March that it hadn't been updated to include reference to to ICSs, um, given that it's supposed to be in place by the end of July, uh, uh, as I understand it. Um, there was a question about um, authority for ambulance staff specifically. Yeah. Um, did you want to pick that I up? I did Amy? see that, Stephen. Yeah, um, ben, yes, Stephen's question. Um, yeah. Well, interestingly, I think the, the, the consultation document actually specifies um, in relation to sort of case scenarios um, and, uh, and questions you may have on that uh, around sort of um, emergency. I think I don't know if it's ambulance is referred to, but that that particular issue, I think, is still yet to be fleshed out. There are sort of it, the code I think it does allude to that issue where there's no alternative but to move or to transfer a person from A to B and there's obviously an, a, a, a sort of implicit reference to a conveyance or a transfer um, and when and that might or might not be covered under the sort of section five slash six of the MCA um, but there is I'd say um, an absence of sort of case scenarios around conveyance, which I think would be helpful within the code, um, because it's it, it it sort of pieces together a few elements of the code, doesn't it? So there's the emergency life saving provision under section four B, which may have some applicability. There's also does it amount to a, a, a deprivation of liberty in the first place, depending upon the length of time of the conveyance or the nature of the sort of measures during that conveyance um, as well. So it it's um, and 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 also I suppose it it raises the question of the sort of portability portability. So if it's a planned move, you, you could in theory um, cater for it within the authorization, but more yeah. often than not, it's not. So um, I think some yeah, case just, scenarios around that would be helpful. 
Yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, just just a couple of things to add, if if I can. Um, you're right. If it's planned, um, then it could be built into an authorization of arrangements which involve a move from A to B um, as part of it. Um, and there is one quirk of dolls that is being fixed by the LPS, which is that dolls includes an authority to keep someone somewhere and to take them back but it doesn't include an authority to take them there in the first place mm. uh, and that's corrected in that gap is corrected in in lps so um on the basis that uh, an arrangement should be authorized before it's put in place it yeah. would then include the authority include to the, the conveyance yeah to take them there um the other thing is come come an emergency conveyance which i don't think you've got is what you've got in mind there talking about between placements but for the sake of completeness um the way that section 4b is beefed up and the way that the ferrera interpretation is stretched probably makes it easier to argue that there, there's no doll uh, yeah. in that emergency conveyance in and of itself so it it will have a few things to say um yeah. about uh, about conveyance and ambulance services um I, i've got a quick question about portability and then i want to give rachel Tell me you're still there, Rachel. Put your camera back on. Uh, uh, ask for your thoughts on uh, on one thing. The the quick question was uh, about responsible bodies and, and portability. If a hospital yeah. patient is discharged uh, into a care home, does it remain the responsible body? Um, I think the short answer to that is no. Uh, post discharge, it, it won't be. Uh, and the re responsible body responsibility will shift to the CCG, read ICS. Uh, if it's the CHC commissioned placement, um, failing which it will be the local authority. Um, the one I want to ask you um, both, please, uh, about for a thought quickly, because I think it's an important point, um, is about advanced consent. Um, and when I stopped reading the chat box a minute ago, there were already two or three questions about advanced consent. Um, one person asked, what's the legal basis for it? Uh, and another said, well, it's not, it's not in the legislation. Uh, so why does it seem to be so loud? Uh, and prominent an idea in the code of practice. Um, uh, Rachel, can I ask you first, what, what do you think of the idea of advanced consent uh, in the code of practice as, as negating a doll? Uh, yeah, I think it's part of the thrust to create the new system and then find ways not to use it, which perhaps some people have seen in the some of the case scenarios in chapter 12. Um, I can see a huge advantage to it in palliative care where people are often yeah. very realistic about mm -hmm. their own um, future when it becomes potentially and in all probability a very short future. And people are very open, I think, to the idea that if it can be predicted what might happen, um, there might be some um, confusion caused by some of the medication and if that happens um, are you do you do you understand that we might not be able to let you leave when you think you're late for your primary school or whatever it might be if you lack capacity I think it becomes harder um, I, I think in various settings I, mental health treatment is somewhere where I think advanced consent to mental health treatment worries me because I am well aware that the reason why there are such safeguards around mental health treatment without a person's consent is because it's pretty heavy duty stuff. So I, I can see the thrust, but I'm, I'm not going quite all the way with it. And I Thanks. quite agree with with saying, you know, it's not actually there in the legal framework. Because mm, one of the concerns is that the, the Law Commission talked about bringing in more emphasis on advanced consent um, into the legislation. The government did not put it in no. the legislation. So is it right to have it? Um, it's actually lifted in and then practice? in the code. Yeah, Amy, go on. No, I would just echo Ra Rachel's thoughts on that. I think I, I can see in, in principle and in theory the um, attraction to um, the concept, but I think, and especially in that sort of end of life palliative care setting, I think um, in other situations where the confinement may be more complex or more long term, um, the, the picture may move um, and change. I, I, th I think um, its scope will be in practice quite 
sort of limited um and, and i think that the code is trying to sort of tackle that 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 thought process in the in there um, but i would have sort of reservations i suppose in in relation to to the the more complex arrangements um yeah yeah, I think I think it's problematic. I have to say, um, I don't really understand the difference between a consent and advance consent or consent yes. in advance. Um, and uh, I was part of a, the, the the law society's committee who uh, were pretty sniffy about bringing more uh, emphasis into advance consent to um, uh, to uh, what would otherwise be a detention under the Mental Health Act on a on a formal basis and with all the safeguards that, that come to it. Uh, come with it and it seems to me pretty um pretty ropey to set to pretend that someone has capacity now and is consenting uh to it yeah Stephen thank you for, for putting in the chat box I, I agree completely it's one thing to say you're going to have surgery after surgery you might be a bit groggy we might need to do this and that and the other uh before you come to your senses and can make your own decisions is that okay uh and I can see how that might be read across more easily into palliative care and end-of-life hospice settings fairly mm. short term uh, but long-term living arrangements um, it feels like asking people to sign a blank check uh, in a way I, I don't think is very comfortable but if you're going to do it it's radical enough it ought to be in the legislation uh, not just in the code of practice. Um, Carl I think had a question can we realistically scope um, at the moment the extent of all this because the impact assessment is using dolls numbers but then chapter 12 comes up with a much narrower definition, a much higher hurdle for, for cases to, to get over. Um, Rachel, what do you think of that? Well, again, I, I, I do think there is this thrust um, following on from the Ferrero judgment of, if it's something you've often talked about, Ben, is the need to see how far that really stretches and how far it should stretch. And um, I think we're seeing that in action. Um, and I am not at all sure. Um, you know, obviously, I don't know quite where it feels right, but they're certainly pushing it out into care homes. They're certainly um, pushing that sort of concept quite hard in hospital settings. So I think, I think it is hard. Um, I think it's worth it being a kind of iterative process as we find out more and as we actually see more of the early goes, the people are having a go already at scoping. And I think when you actually see it, it's much easier to critique something that you can see. So um, you say, oh, yeah, I like that bit, but I, that doesn't speak to my experience. I can't see that bit. Um, being born out and I think we will kind of get there um, mm. well enough to to kick off you know uh, uh, when we do get to the kickoff time and the whistle blows for the start of LPS and then after that I'm sure we'll all be doing bits of um, steering the ship yeah you've talked about the whistle blowing I can picture us all going over the top uh, oh dear, into <laughs> into the world of, of LPS and into the face of a, of a raft of challenges if it's on the basis of the guidance of the code of practice. Um, oh in, in terms of your question, Carl, the, 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 the scope and the numbers, I, I would say if we are seeing vastly fewer LPS cases than dolls cases, then there's a problem because mm. the code of practice can say uh, what it thinks the acid test is, but it can't change the law um and and it is what it is and at face value the government's committed to the cheshire west acid test everyone who is deprived of their liberty per the case law today will be deprived of their liberty per the case law in april 2024 unless the supreme court changes it and so you've got everyone who is currently um deprived of their liberty in a care home or a hospital plus everyone who meets the acid test outside those settings um so lps ought to have in purely logical terms a whole lot more people in it than dolls does at the moment um and uh, uh, manipulating the interpretation of the cheshire west judgment through a code of practice um brings significant challenges and i'd expect it to be challenged in court fairly quickly um the good news is and i, I will finish on on this point looking at the time so uh, we'll make sure we we finish on time. We'll pick everything else up in a Q&A uh, document. Um, 
it is a consultation. Chapter 12, the definition of a doll to trigger the whole shebang is by far the most controversial bit. Um, and uh, I think it is appropriate to to deal with that in our consultation responses. If we think they're, they're interpreting the law, the, the law wrongly, um, we should say so. Um, and this is our chance. And it's important that we do because, you know, whatever process follows, whether it's dolls or LPS, it's identification of a situation as a deprivation of someone's liberty to um, uh, engage their Article 5 rights uh, that, that brings it all into uh, into action. Um, a couple of the questions were about the difficulty interpreting for error in Section 4B and the difficulty squaring the case studies uh, in the code with um, with the case law. Um, I think those are perfectly fair points. And as I say, I expect that to be uh, quite a focus of the, the consultation and um, discussions over the next few uh, months. Um, I think what we've seen is that uh, the next one of these will will pencil it in for an hour and a half um, uh, because it has been uh, a lot to get through today. I'm sorry if it's um, short and sweet for now. I hope it's a helpful staging point on your thinking um, about the code of practice and your response to the consultation. Do get in touch if we can help you uh, do that. Uh, and we'll follow this up with the uh, the resources, uh, as we said. There's the contact details for, for Amy uh, and for myself uh, and a generic LPS uh, email address that we can all pick up. Uh, my thanks again to Rachel. Uh, yes, thank for, you, for Rachel. joining us. Uh, and Rachel's very kindly said she's going to chip into the uh, Q&A document we send you as, uh, afterwards, so it will have that uh, benefit as well. Um, and thank you all very much uh, indeed for, for joining us. Do give us your feedback on the session so we know uh, what to do next that's uh, that's most helpful uh, for you. Uh, thank you all very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.